Now we're going to move on to some fishes who really do move around. Uh, we're going to hear about the eel, the life cycle of the eel, which is a 20,000 kilometer round trip. And I'd like to welcome Håkan Westerberg, who's from the Institute of Freshwater Research here in Sweden. Welcome, Håkan. Thank you for the introduction and thanks to Fish Base for allowing me to talk about my favorite slimy fish. <laughs> so this speech uh, will, will draws heavily on, on work in a number of, of uh, research projects that have been going on for quite some years now. And I, I want to acknowledge the uh, contribution from many cool uh, workers. So, oops. <coughs> the eel is famous for its long migration. Uh, actually, there are other fish species that uh, make even longer uh, movements in the in the ocean, but uh, there are a number of, of interesting uh, features with the eel that I want to, to talk about. And <coughs> the ocean phase of the eel life takes place here in what is called the subtropical current gyre in the North Atlantic. And that is uh, a permanent current going around, uh, driven by the west winds in the north and the trade winds in the south. And uh, on the western side, we have the Gulf Stream, which then wears towards east in, uh, and divides into two uh, different branches because the North Atlantic Drift here is what is called the Azor current. And, <coughs> and then all the way here is a slow recirculation uh, which are, is collected into to the North Equatorial current and closes the loop. So, in the eye of this gigantic gyre is the Sargasso Sea. And this is where, where the life of the eel starts. <coughs> and the eel larva is called Leptocephalus larva. They don't look at all like uh, the adult eel. It's a, a willow leaf, transparent uh, little fish that uh, drifts for several years in, the, in this current uh, uh, and is brought from the Sargasso over to the European side. And when it reaches the uh, continental shelf, it metamorphoses into what is called a glass eel, which actually looks like an eel, <laughs> and, uh, but is still transparent. And <coughs> then those glass eels uh, go up into fresh water and, and spread all over the fresh water areas in, in Europe, all the way from no northernmost Norway down to North Africa and into the, the Mediterranean. What is remarkable when you study those uh, glass eels over the whole distribution range, there is no genetic difference. There are, they are well mixed. It, 
the, the Sargasso breeding is like a genetic melting pot every generation. And the implication of that is that the adult eel, after like 5 to 50 years in fresh water, when it starts back, it has no uh, genetic knowledge of <laughs> where to go. Not like uh, migrating birds that uh, ha have uh, like a, a genetic compass uh, sense that I it can follow. And <coughs> but nevertheless, they, they seem to, to do it. <laughs> And uh, th that is one of the uh, interesting uh, questions, I think, with, with the eel. Uh, oops, sorry. Those of you who have read this beautiful book, The All Evangeliet, but by Patrick Svensson, uh, know about the eel question, which uh, is uh, something that has been around since an, uh, the, the antique times. And the reason, uh, or the background, is that eel was an appreciated fish in the whole Mediterranean area, but nobody had seen uh, a major eel, uh, an eel with eggs or, or, or uh, roe. And, and then they, uh, it suddenly appeared, <laughs> those glass eels. So I think that, that uh, Aristotle uh, proposed that their uh, eel uh, were generated but by spontaneous generation from decaying uh, stuff in, uh, on the shore. And uh, I, I must say, I, I think he, he, that was face-based logic conclusion. Uh, why should he have any idea about the impossibility of spontaneous generation when that was part of a lot of, of the uh, lore at that time? So, uh, but anyway, <laughs> the, it took a long time uh, until the 18th century to, to identify and find uh, the genitalia of the eel. And <coughs> that led to the ne next question. If they reproduce like any other fish, where do they do it? And that was the second formulation of the eel question. Where, where, where was the breeding place? This is a picture of Johannes Smith the uh, Danish uh, fishery biologist. Uh, it's taken 1906 outside uh, the Faroe Islands when he w had just found the first Leptocephalus larvae out in the Atlantic. And that started him off on a hunt for smaller and smaller larvae all over the North Atlantic. And in 1922, he, he was uh, certain that the smallest were found here in the Sargasso Sea. And uh, that was then the solution to the second uh, eel question. But there is still a question today, and that is the why we have this very dramatic decline of, 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 of eels that started for the European eel here in the 1980s with a drop from 100% uh, glass eel arrival here to less than 10% in, 
in, in recent years. And we find the same uh, development in, in uh, the American eel species and in the, in the Japanese eel species with, with some differences in timing. So then what is the cause for this uh, large decline? There are many hypotheses but, uh, about habitat loss, pollution, ocean climatic factor and, and so on, uh, but no clear answer. Oops, sorry. Ah. But this uh, question about decline has started a new era of eel research in the ocean. So there are, have been uh, made a number of tagging studies the uh, larval phase has been uh, looked at again with new surveys in the Sagasso Sea and uh, modeling of, of the drift of the larva. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Uh, one of the projects was an EU. Uh, project that has uh, uh, tagged eels in different places from Spain up to Sweden uh, to look at how they migrate uh, in, in the open Atlantic. Uh, there, there were two types of tags. The Satellite tag, I think I have one here. Well, it's it's a <laughs> data logger that measures depth and temperature and then is released uh, at a program date, goes up to the surface and transmits the data uh, to shore. It's expensive, but you, you uh, usually get uh, data back. Another alternative that we have tried is using ordinary data loggers, but putting floats on them. So if the eel dies and loses this uh, data logger, it will uh, rise to the surface and drift and be, be uh, found on the shore and surprisingly high percentage uh, are actually found again. Uh, both of them give a time series of, of uh, temperature and depth re radio stations. And when you look at those uh, serious. The most obvious thing is that all the eels, that once they come outside the continental shelf, they have the same behavior of switching between uh, nighttime shallow depth and then in the daytime they go down to a deeper level, in this case from 400 to 1,000 meters. And th those are two eels that were released at the same ti uh, time somewhere in the uh, Western Atlantic. Uh, and, and it's two days, two months after they were released. And they had separated like uh, 100 kilometers at least. But you see, they behave exactly the same. And this is longer time series to, to, uh, that, that show the same regular uh, diurnal uh, behavior. You can also see that there is a difference in activity in the uh, nighttime shallower phase 
with, with a little higher uh, wiggle on the, on the curve than, than in the night. And here is the red is the temperature. This is a tag, uh, an eel which is uh, migrating in the Norwegian Sea Basin. And uh, it goes down uh, into the cold water in the uh, daytime, uh, down to, to almost zero degree. And here it passes the, the threshold to the uh, south of, of uh, Shetland Ferris, where the deep water is warmer. And they, they have essentially the same uh, depth amplitude, but the temperature is completely different at the, the nighttime depths, which indicates that. Or, or, so, I mean, the problem is to understand why do they do this? Because once they start migrating, they stop feeding. Uh, so they have no reason to, to search for food. Uh, they have good reason to avoid being eaten. We found a lot of, of uh, predation going on on, on the tagged eels. But uh, why don't they stay down here? Why, why spend a lot of, of effort going up and down every day when, when they might as well uh, do the whole migration down here. So that <coughs> uh, another uh, uh, observation is that this type of behavior with, with this diurnal uh, migration is the same in all uh, freshwater eel species that have been, been studied. So this is uh, an Indonesian species, this is the American eel, this is the Japanese eel. They all do the same thing. It turns out that this uh, time depth variation is quite useful when we get the data uh, filed back to reconstruct w w what the eel has been doing. Uh, the uh, the uh, go, uh, uh, change in depth is synchronous with the light cycle uh, and that means that we can use that to to uh, calculate the time of local known, which gives us the longitude. And this is an example of an eel that was released uh, at Gibraltar and recovered in the Azores. Uh, uh, and, and the dots are daily estimates of longitude. And, and, the, and then I have just applied a, a smoothing function to that. And the varia variability here is probably because of, of cloudiness. Uh, I mean, if, if it's more cloudy in the morning than in the evening, you get, tend to shift your, your light curve uh, back and forth. But in the mean, you get a quite nice longitude uh, estimate. And that can be used in the next step to estimate the latitude. Because now we know that at a certain date, the, the eel is on, on a certain uh, longitude. And we can uh, look at what depth and what temperature it uh, had at that day <laughs> in in the daytime uh, uh, sorry in the nighttime uh, level and then go into uh, oceanographic daily recalc uh, re, re analysis model 
that uh, so and plot the the temperature section along this longitude, longitude and and in this case we had 12.4 degree it's this line and 12.4 degrees oh sorry and and uh, 410 meter depths and the uh, intersect section is here and then we knew that this latitude it was the yield of that day. And then you do that over and over again and get some kind of reconstruction of the, of the whole trajectory. And that also allows us to, uh, to uh, calculate the migration speed. And in this case, it's, uh, if I remember, yeah, 5 to 28 kilometers per day. It has varied, but uh, like 15 kilometers per day uh, on the average. So then I started to look, look at uh, all the data we had, or picked out the best data that we had, where we had this diurnal uh, migration all the way up to the point where where the tag was released and we had a, a good position for the end point of it. Uh, and, and, and then I plotted those. The dotted line here are, are individual reconstructions. So, but what we see is that we have a number of, of, of uh, points lying along a north-south uh, trajectory and another set on an east-west uh, trajectory. Those tags are a little special. Th those are eels that were uh, taken on ships and uh, released over here uh, with the hope of, of uh, indicating where uh, they, they should go for, for the spawning. So, but I, I've used them for, for just for, for this uh, uh, end position calculation. And then for, for each of those pop pop-ups, <laughs> I, I have uh, registered the nighttime depths, the white dots here, and the day, daytime depths, the red corresponding for the, the same uh, pop-up. Uh, so there are two points for each uh, position, and, and then I plotted that in a uh, hydrographic section along those boxes I, I uh, showed you, and <coughs> both for temperature and salinity. Uh, and it turns out that uh, at least roughly the uh, daytime depths follows the 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 main the permanent thermocline in in, in the ocean. We can do the same with the east east west section and and find similar that that the daytime depths follows the the uh, in this case around. 12 point, uh, uh, between uh, 10 and uh, uh, 15 degrees. Uh, one peculiar thing is that uh, the nighttime depth is, is a little more shallow here in the beginning than further on, but it, it looks like 
here is the outflow of Mediterranean deep water. Uh, and they, they seem not to like to go into that. In the Mediterranean, the, it's uh, si similar that, that they stay below the uh, seasonal thermocline uh, in the uh, night and then go deeper down in the daytime. And e deeper down here is essentially the same temperature as in the daytime, early in the nighttime. So, so uh, this depth uh, difference seems not to be related to, to uh, temperature structure. <coughs> so, yeah, to sum up this one, the direction seems to be against uh, the uh, North Atlantic drift or, and the ASO currents. Depth preference uh, is somewhere in the permanent thermocline. Uh, and speed over ground is low, uh, typically just 5 to 30 kilometers per day. So if we then have a look at uh, the, uh, the uh, leptocephaly, this is uh, a joint survey in 2014 of, of a German and a, a Danish research vessel. And, oops, sorry, <laughs> the red dots are where small leptocephaly were found, the uh, black ones were, were uh, zero stations. So it, the larvae are distributed in a quite large area, about 2,000 kilometers in east-west direction. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I tried to look at, I mean, the, the survey is in, in uh, ap April or early May. Uh, those are length measurement as a function of day or year taken from a database of like 4,000 leptocephalus. Uh, catches from mainly from Schmidt and and then you see that the hatching size uh, on the reg regression line is in the beginning of February so I took the positions that where we observed uh, uh, larva <laughs> and then used oceanographic models to, to uh, recalculate backwards in time to, to the 1st of February, with the hope that all should convert to one or two uh, nice uh, spawning places, which isn't the case. It seems that spawning is very spread out all over the, all over the place. Uh, here are some other modeling stuff uh, where uh, th this, this is the area where uh, a large number of virtual larvae were, were released and followed on their way over to, to, to uh, the, the, the European side and uh, there it's color coded with the uh, number of days. So here is after uh, blue is after uh, the first year, uh, yellow the second, and uh, orange the third year of, of drift. Uh, this is an other calculation using the actual uh, observed larva positions, where I calculated forwards in time uh, for one year. 
And uh, it, we, we see that there is a lot of eddies going on and just a few that really goes into the uh, big gyre. The majority seems to be stuck in the uh, Sargasso Sea for at least a year. Uh, yeah, another way to illustrate this uh, gradual and long uh, drift of, of the uh, eels is uh, this is based on the uh, length cohorts. There are three cohorts of, of larva present at the same time in the Atlantic. And the, the, the uh, black ones here, uh, the dots, is, uh, uh, catches uh, that, that, uh, uh, of, of the zero-year class, red the one-year class, and to, uh, green the uh, year class two. So, uh, and then there are also been uh, data on the vertical migration of the, of the Leptocephalus larva. And it turns out that they do a similar uh, uh, diurnal migration, but much sh shallower. So they, they tend to be found around 50 to 100 meter in the night, and then down to, to, to 100 to 300 meter in the in the daytime. Sorry. So, to sum up about the leptos, uh, it's the large. Uh, spawning area and it takes place early in the year and and the slow migration speed of the adults means that most of them won't be able to reach the spawning the same year as they leave Europe uh, and as I said there were three different year classes of, of leptus in this uh, tropical year and they drift in the upper layer, shallow at night and deeper in data. So then, if we look at the, uh, again on the, on the trend in direction of, of the migration, uh, they seem to follow the, uh, the, this branch of the North Atlantic current, which is the one that carries the heat up to the north. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then many uh, from the southern region seem to follow uh, or go against the Azor current. Uh, and then can we sum this up in some way? So this is the uh, current, uh, just a generalized picture of the current speed. Uh, the, the highest uh, speed in the gyre is up in the mixed upper layer, uh, but it penetrates all the way down to a thousand meter. Uh, temperature is also highest and in, in this mixed upper layer and then decreases and this is the permanent thermocline region. And then here comes the leptos moving with the current and here comes the adult going up and down, moving against the current. And why do they do this? My uh, hypothesis is that, that the leptus releases some 
smell, a pheromone of some kind, which is, uh, I mean, eels are well known to, to have uh, an exceptionally fine uh, sense of smell. And <coughs> the temperature curve here also uh, says about what that uh, pheromone concentration would look like. That will be injected here in the upper mixed layer and then diffused down into the permanent thermocline. So my suggestion is that the eel, the adult eel, goes up to this uh, level in, in the, in the uh, in the night to find a level of maximum vertical gradient of this pheromone. Uh, and then it goes back down to, to avoid being eaten. And uh, it's also uh, if you look at how currents work, that uh, the current gradient, vertical gradient of the current will tend to be in the direction of the main uh, current. So if it finds a level with this maximum vertical gradient of, of, of the smell of, of leptos, then it can give a, a, a clue about direction from the local current shear, which is, I think, very nice system because that means that everything is locally observable. And uh, so the Adult eel don't really need to know anything about where it is and where it is going. It just goes up, look, look as long as there are uh, lep lepto <laughs> pheromones in the water, it can uh, guess approximately in which direction to, to uh, move to get to the spawning place. So, thank you and <laughs>